This is a podcast by the RASC Group. It's for educational purposes only. So please do not make a financial, legal, investment or taxation decision based on solely what you hear in this show. Welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. We're on a mission to be Australia's most trusted property podcast. I'm Owen Rask, founder of the Rask Group. I'm Pete Wardgen, author and buyer's agent. I'm Amy Lenardi, and I am a buyer's agent. I'm Chris Bates, ex-financial planner and mortgage broker. Together, we'll take you through every step of your property journey. From first home buyer to decades of property investing. G'day, welcome to the Australian Property Podcast. I'm Pete Wargent from Alan Wargent Property Buyers. And today I've got the lovely Amy Lunardi with me. Amy, uh, welcome. Great to always uh, chat with you. Good morning, Pete. And uh, where are you this fine morning? You're uh, down in Melbourne, I guess, busy oh, uh, yes. buying properties for clients. Unlike you, Pete, you're a jet setter. You go, you travel all the time. I'm in Melbourne 99%. <laughs> The yeah, time. It's, it's, yeah it's, I think I've always had a short attention span. I think that's part of my issue, which uh, is uh, has its pros and cons. It makes it difficult with uh, being in a classroom at school or uh, trying to sit in one place uh, for work and stuff. But uh, yeah, it's got its benefits as well. Just in uh, sunny Noosa this morning, so we've well, got I took absolutely... a toddler. I took a toddler on an airplane for one hour last weekend, and I won't be doing that again anytime soon. <laughs> yes, we've uh, yeah, let's um, yeah, not go down that rabbit hole. We've done a lot of long haul in recent years. Actually, our kids are getting a bit older now, so at least mm. they can watch movies and be a bit self sufficient. But uh, God, it can be challenging. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so we've got an absolutely massive subject to try and cover today. Let's see what we can do in half an hour or forty minutes on commercial property because we get loads of questions about this, uh, and a lot of the questions are like, should I invest in resi? Should I invest in commercial? And then it sort of sets off this uh, chain reaction of other questions. Um, so we thought um, we'll try and head off as much of that subject as we can today. And um, I think, um, I mean, am I right in thinking your partner actually works in commercial property? Yes. So as a, as a buyer's agent, I only focus on residential properties, but my husband is a, a commercial real estate agent. So I have, I have some exposure to the commercial space through that, through vicarious learnings. Um, but I don't personally buy commercial properties. And just be, it's just a, a space that I've decided to not specialize in. Um, but we'll still aim to tackle the 101. I'll call it the 101 of commercial property today. But like you said, Pete, it is a really big topic and maybe we can deep dive a bit further another time. But how much do you focus on or, or do, you, do you purchase commercial properties for clients? And if so, what type? Well, there's two different things here. Firstly, what do I own personally? Mm. And uh, yes, in our portfolio, we do have some commercial, uh, mainly farmland for us. Um, uh, we, we also completely randomly have a beach shack, uh, but that's a different question, or a beach hut. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, mainly farmland for us. But that was partly circumstantial because we inherited some and then we ended up adding some because we already had some that we we were letting out and we were growing as uh, using as cropland, and um, you know that's kind of an asset class in its own right, really. Um, mm. Farmland for growing of crops or grazing, uh, but quite often it's popular, especially in areas where people think they might be able to develop the farmland in the future into housing, uh, because then it's got a kind of a hidden value. But actually, that's the that's the thing. There's loads of different parts of the commercial property umbrella as an asset class. Now, as a buyer's agent, mostly what we do is industrial or warehouse type property. But actually, it's a big asset class that incorporates things like uh, office space or shopping centers or retail property or showroom. So when you actually uh, hear the term commercial property, there's actually a, a wide range of uh, assets that could come under that uh, that one sort of catch-all term. Uh, but yeah, as a buyer's agent, most of what we do is in the industrial space where People like to invest in that type of property because of the rental yields, much higher than you would get in the residential space. So, uh, so yeah, there's two different things there. What do we own? It's farmland mainly. Uh, but what do we buy? It's buyer's agents, mainly industrial. 
Yeah. So if we were breaking down commercial properties into, I guess, a, a couple of distinct categories, because as an investor, it's all well and good to say, hey, I'm going to go invest in a commercial property. But just like being a residential investor too, you could do something as small as a car park. You know, I, that's a kind of, that's a commercial property investment I've, I've we've got a car park in our portfolio I always forget about it because it's just a bit a bit random but um all the way through to you know massive massive uh commercial sites you know we're talking about Harvey Normans or um investing into you know uh real estate investment trust there's so many different layers here but quite often when people think about commercial property we can talk about retail and retail, think of it essentially any kind of store where you can walk into and purchase goods or services. So that could be anything like a cafe, it could be a gym, it could be just a, a shop. There's so many categories which come under retail and they can be quite small retail, like you, you know, you shop on the corner in your meal bar down the street, all the way through to really large scale retail, like showrooms and furniture stores, like Harvey Norman, et cetera, really bigger spaces and you know, shopping centers, for example. And then you've got things like medical centers and childcare and, you know, aged care. That's kind of retail. I feel like it's almost its, its own separate category. And then from there, we have what, what you mentioned before, Pete, we've got um, industrial. So that could be like warehousing, factories that produce things, we have office spaces, and that could be anything again from a really small office to a skyscraper in the city, which has hundreds of offices in them. And then we've got hotels. And I would I would agree with you, Pete, that farmland and rural is, is almost its own separate mm. category as well. Yes, which uh, I guess, uh, I mean, the, the reason I like farmland, two reasons, it's indestructible, we'll always need it because uh, people need food, but also in the UK, it's inheritance tax free as well, as long as you're actually running a farm. Uh, right. So yes, in the UK where inheritance tax is extortionately high at 40%, um, oh, if you're running farmland productively, you're not getting captured by that. But uh, yeah, it's kind of a standalone category. I've got a friend who owns a a big hotel but uh, for most mere mortals i guess most of us in the commercial space we're probably looking at something like a shed a warehouse a shop maybe a small office something like that so when you're looking at the choices um the most i think the most popular uh, at the moment would be the industrial type of property uh reasonable entry prices very good yields um retail is also popular but it's, it can be a bit of a fickle asset class as more people are shopping online these days. I think um, probably a good place to tackle this subject then, Amy, is uh, what was the name of that book, uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why? Uh, is, uh, we often get people come to us and say, you know, I've got a budget, a million dollars or 1.5. Should I buy a residential property like a house in Melbourne that I can renovate or add value to or develop? Or should I look at commercial? And what are the pros and cons of each? So, uh, so we let's have a little start at that point. Um, you know, what are the things that people would need to contemplate um, if they were just making that decision? So that's my AFL siren going off. It's probably <laughs> that's that's probably a list of the Brisbane Lions injury list from the last two weeks, which is uh, ever lengthening, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess look, the the main reason that people would look towards commercial, I guess, is that the net return, the rental yields can be much higher. So the net return on an industrial property might be 5%, it might be 6 7 or even higher in some cases, versus residential where I suppose, particularly in Melbourne, the rental yield on a house might be 3 or something like that, even on a gross basis. Um, mm. I suppose that would be the starting point. It's generally higher returns. Now, of course, it might come at the cost of lower capital growth and there can be some risks associated, but it's it's largely more of an income-focused asset class. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to commercial properties, the tenant is paying your outgoings. This is very different to residential where the landlord is paying the rates, the landlord is paying the insurance, the body corporate fees, maintenance, et cetera. In commercial, the tenant pays the outgoings. They're paying the rates and 
um, land tax in some cases, um, body corporate, et cetera. So that to some people is a really strong benefit and a really strong pro. And therefore, you know, it's a, it's a, it can be a much more appealing asset class in terms of cash flows as well. And that's why you also have to be mindful when you're comparing yields between commercial and residential. If you're assessing a commercial property based on its net yield, make sure you're also then comparing it to, you know, a residential property on its net yield as well, because most people talk about gross yields with residential property. And just to recap what what that actually means is when we're talking about gross yield for a residential property, you just take the rental income per year um, and you divide it by the the amount the property is worth. And that's what a lot of people use to benchmark and compare. But net yield is more important because you can compare two different properties and they can have the same gross yield. But once you factor in, maybe one of those properties has really high body corporate fees or really high council fees. And once you take those expenses into account, your net yields, which is really the more important thing, because that's, you know, your cash flow after you've paid all of these expenses, um, they can be wildly different as well. So just bear, bear that in mind when you're comparing yields between properties and between asset classes as well. Absolutely. I think on a residential property, there's a general view that, you know, you stick it up for rent, you'll find a tenant. It's pretty easy. Rental vacancies across Australia are about 1% in the residential market. So as long as you get the price point right and the property is reasonably well presented and it's in a decent location, you'll find a tenant. Um, now, the commercial market is a bit different. Interesting point you made there on the net return. Um, just thinking about some properties that came across in uh, Noosa, just to around the traps and um, yeah, places with body corporates, $20,000 a year. So it's one thing saying that the gross the gross yield might be up here, but the, there goes 20000 in the body corporate and mm. you've got landlord insurance and there's rates to pay and there's always repairs and vacancies. And actually the net figure can be a whole lot less. And um, when people, uh, as they often do on the Sunshine Coast, uh, do short stay tenancies, uh, there's more vacancies. Uh, the property managers take a bigger clip and the net yield might be way lower than the gross yield. Um, so, yes, you've got to compare apples with apples, as they say. Now, in the commercial space, you're generally looking at net yields or net returns. And uh, I guess the the key here, though, is the tenancy. Um, you've got to get the right tenant in the property because in a commercial property, the leases could be much longer. They could be locked in for three, four, five years, potentially with inflation increases baked into the contract or built into the lease at the start of the lease term. Um, So you need to be a lot clearer really about the terms of the lease, who's going to rent the property. Um, For example, if it's um, an industrial or warehouse type property, um, you know, it might be rented to a business for a number of years on one lease. Um, And um, it's not quite so straightforward when you come to renew a lease. Uh, You could have a period of vacancy, uh, the property might need to be amended for another tenant. Um, so uh, that is one of the things to factor in. Even though the yield may be higher, the, the vacancy periods could, in theory, be longer. Mm. So coming back to, we'll focus on, I guess, the pros a little bit more because the te- I feel like the vacancy is probably the biggest, one of the biggest cons, right? Mm. Um, but with leases in commercial spaces, like you've just said, Pete, one of the advantages or the perceived advantages is the leases are much longer. And if you get the right tenant and if you get a good tenant, that's a great thing because that provides you as a uh, landlord with security around income for that period of time. And within that commercial lease, you will have agreed rental increases. So for example, uh, annually, this is going to increase by 3% per year or whatever it is, or it could be in line with CPI, so inflation, and that then just gives you that gives you cash flow security over X amount of years, and it also means that when you sell that property, the value is tied to that tenant and to that rental amount. So that's really a, a like a strong benefit for commercial property, and that all really needs to get negotiated and properly documented into the lease at the very beginning because once that fixed term is lease is in place, then, you know, that underpins the, the length of that tenancy. 
and they can be much longer. They can be 10 year, depending on the scale of the property, it could be 10 year leases, for example, or sometimes seen longer as well. Um, and then the tenant might have after that what's called an option. So that's in the tenant's benefit to extend that lease for longer if they want to, and that's up to the tenant when that the time comes. Um, another benefit as well is, well, this is a perceived benefit, is the landlord tends to have greater rights than residential in that, you know, if the tenant doesn't pay rent, and bear in mind, I'm talking about Victoria here, it might be a bit different depending on which state you're in, but say if the tenant doesn't pay rent, a breach notice can be issued after 14 days. So, you know, if that's not rectified by another 14 days, the landlord can just evict the tenant. Whereas in residential, there's a bit more, um, you know, the tenant can go to VCAD and, you know, there's there's a lot of complexity here, but it's it's a bit more commercial, which is, I know it's a bit of like, it's obvious because it's commercial, but it's more business transactional. It's You're not providing a home to someone. It's like a business. Well, if you're not paying rent, you get out, full stop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you're right. There's been a general shift in recent years towards increased tenancy rights in residential property, which um, we understand why that's the case um, because it's, it's somebody's home where they're paying mm. rent to live. But then you can have issues then uh, with evictions and yeah. um, getting people who aren't paying. You know, the, the process can be very protracted. That's and right. um, yeah, it's, it's a different setup in commercial because, as you said, it's much more of a business like transaction. If the tenant's not paying, uh, then relatively quickly. Uh, things can change around. So as you say, this could be a perceived benefit. I was actually going to say, you know, businesses might not be around for 10 years, but then I was reminded we're going to focus on the positives first <laughs> and then we'll come back to Yeah, the, I've got the some more positives going, first let's before go we go to negative, Pete. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to be... Uh, I, I, it's my uh, nature as an accountant to highlight the risks in property, but let's, let's oh, focus yeah. on why do people do commercial? So we, we mentioned longer lease terms, um, you know, potentially greater landlord rights in that sort of balance balance of power if that's the right phrase um but, uh, but also on that point um things like bonds you know the bond held might be larger as security uh for a commercial lease mm. and uh, you get things like um well i guess uh, guarantors and more security uh, mm. you mentioned the sort of potential for longer fixed terms i think um i guess this is very much on a case by case basis residential leases um the terms are much more standardized you know i think we all sort of people generally know where they stand but a commercial lease you really need to review the terms of those leases much more closely and ideally get um get some legal assistance to do so because you really you know the the tenancy is really the core of a commercial investment and uh, if you get the if you misunderstand the lease terms that's not going to be to your benefit as the landlord yeah, exactly. So even understanding things like, you know, it, when, when this tenant moves out, are they going to essentially make good uh, and remove all of their fixtures and fittings and take everything with them? Like what are the, what, what's built into the lease to say this is exactly how the tenant is going to return this property to you at the very end, especially if you've bought it with that tenant already in there. So when you are buying a commercial property, you should get that lease reviewed by a commercial lawyer, ideally, uh, because they can be a lot more complicated than, than residential leases. Um, another, bon another benefit as well is that generally speaking, the tenant is responsible for repairs and maintenance, which how different is that, Pete, to <laughs> residential property? Um, I'm not talking about like big capital works, just say there's a structural issue and something really needs to be prepared as part of the building, but just repairs and maintenance, that's the tenant's responsibility. So that's for for some landlords, that's a huge benefit. Well, it goes back to that point on uh, gross versus net yields, doesn't it? Because in a residential property, uh, the landlord... Uh, depending on you know the the condition of the property and the nature of the tenant, like the, the landlord could be on the hook for repairs very regularly in some instances. You know, if uh, if something uh, breaks or is not working or something gets damaged, you know, you can get or there's uh, I don't know spillage or something. A lot of stuff comes back onto the landlord quite often. Uh, but in commercial, uh, depending on the terms, uh, generally, you know, a tenant may be responsible for things like repairs, maintenance. Uh, it's generally the capital 
types of works that are still on the landlord. Mm. Um, yeah, interesting, you mentioned there about um, uh, tenants having to potentially make good property. I've, I've seen uh, just in my travels around the UK uh, over the sort of Christmas period, I was looking at there's a lot of vacant shops um, in regional parts of United Kingdom. And just out of interest, really, I was looking at uh, some of these vacant properties thinking, well, there must be some contrarian buys here because there's been a general shift towards uh, big shopping centres in Britain and also um, uh, more online retail. But uh, you quite often see the, the state in which properties are left and there's stuff everywhere, you know, and um, if you're going to get these properties up and running, you, there's, there's actually work to be done. Uh, but I suppose uh, the potential benefit there as an investor or landlord, relatively low entry prices in some of these types of property, but also just diversification. You're getting something different. If you're a residential property investor, um, you've got maybe a few properties in your portfolio. Well, commercial is something a bit different. It might not be. Yeah. Um, so an asset that's so correlated with the rest of your portfolio uh, might be something that provides more of an income rather than the capital growth. Uh, so it's, it's a way to sort of spread your risk around. And also, um, yeah, just a, a, a potentially a property that you could uh, pay down with the, the rental income. So you could own an unencumbered asset at the end of, say, five or 10 years. Exactly right. And diversification, you can do that in so many different ways through property. You can do it by diversifying locations. You can have a property in Melbourne, a property in Brisbane, one in Tassie, et cetera. You can diversify by type of residential properties, you can have an apartment here, a house there, et cetera. And then you can diversify through asset classes too. So res have a one couple of residential properties, a commercial property, et cetera. And I think we're at the point now where we're considering our next property to be a commercial, probably an industrial property because it makes sense for us at this point in time. But I would say as a general rule of thumb, this is not across the board, obviously, nothing is with property. Um, investing in commercial, I would say, is overall a bit more uh, complicated slash sophisticated than investing in residential. So what you tend to find is that uh, commercial investors often do already have a portfolio of residential properties and then they're starting to diversify or maybe they've just started commercial from the start and that's their, um, you know, they've, they've decided to specialise and focus in that, that but they've become educated about it as well. But that there is a sense. scale. Yeah, there is a there is a scale with all of these things too. Um, you know, again, you can be I'll call it a mum and dad investor. I don't know where that phrase came from, Pete. Because <laughs> they're not. You don't have to be a mum or a dad to invest in property. Um, but you can go and buy a just a single shop down the street, or you can buy an office within an office building, and that's obviously going to be much more straightforward than buying an industrial complex, which has, you know, seven factories in it, for example. So there's, you know, different entry points, like you said. And in some cases, you might, you might not be able to afford to buy a residential property, but you could afford to buy a little factory or a little warehouse kind of shed situation or an office. Um, and that's your way to get into property investing. And that's worth exploring. Yeah, well, I've noticed um, in recent times, office spaces are often very cheap. Um, there's been a shift towards working from home, uh, generally less office space in demand than was the case in, say, 2018 or 2019. And the entry prices can be quite low. I think um, uh, the financing of a commercial purchase might be slightly different. And I guess... Um, well, this probably flows into some of the, the, the potential cons anyway. All right, let's get into cons, Peter. Now you're ready for it. Let's talk about this. the drawbacks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think it's just it's wise before thinking, well, higher yield and therefore I'm going to do it. I mean, we all know, or many of us know, the, the main benefits of residential property, as you said, easy to understand. You can leverage it um, quite significantly. Um, but I suppose the, the flip side for commercial is, um, yes, it can be more complex sometimes. Uh I think uh, the, the financing is a big one. Uh, generally, the banks are going to have shorter loan terms. In residential, we often see people on interest-only loans and just extending them out forever. It's less common, I think, in commercial space. Uh, generally, uh, lower loan-to-value ratios, or in plain English, you need a bigger deposit usually to buy commercial property. I think we already mentioned the potential for vacancies. 
it wouldn't be that unusual to have a say six month period between tenants for yeah. industrial property. Uh, and imagine that in residential, it's not. I wouldn't say unheard of because mm. I'm sure there are people out there who have experienced that. But you know, for my investment properties that I've bought for clients our average vacancy will be a couple of weeks. Mm. And if it's longer than that, there's something wrong and it's usually the rental amount. Maybe that landlord's decided, hey, let's try and get an extra 30 bucks a week and the market's not responding and we drop the rent and we'll lease it out. But how many times have you been walking down the peat, the the, the peat, <laughs> the street peat and seen an empty shop and then you're walking down that same street six months later and it, it's still empty? Mm. Um, so can there can be really extended periods and gosh during COVID remember the vacancies there and commercial in, investors um, really 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 suffered throughout that but you have to plan for it so you have to have such bigger buffers in place for between tenancies the benefit is you know once you've got that tenant they're in there for a long time you've got to plan ahead <clears throat> just in case and I remember asking my husband, you know, I'm walking past this shop all the day, all the time, why don't they just drop the rent and they'll get a tenant? He said it doesn't really work that way because you still have to have that right tenant who wants that specific shop and wants that space and wants to move in. And, of course, it still comes down to supply and demand as well. So vacancy I think is a really key thing that you need to be aware of when it comes to a, like a, a real negative about commercial property. Yeah, so it's been a major issue in Britain in recent years with empty retail properties that are now selling in some cases in some of the regional towns at very cheap levels. I've seen them selling for fifty thousand pounds and ten percent potential yield, but they're but they're empty. Often, what's been popular with investors in recent times has been uh, retail properties with what they call uppers, basically a residential flats above them or or out the mm. back, because uh, then you're getting a, a hybrid of commercial and residential. Um, I, I think that um, uh, speaks to one of the other sort of issues to be aware of in commercial, and that is the sensitivity to the business cycle. Um, so at the moment, for example, lots of building and construction firms are going under uh, due to the environment. The prevailing environment is very difficult for people in that sector. And so if your tenant is, um, you know, if you've got a commercial property relating out to a building or construction firm, uh, it doesn't mean that necessarily they're going to, face a, a challenge but there's been a, a spate of insolvencies and this is one of the things that happens in the business cycle there'll be periods like in uh, 2008 and 2009 when lots of businesses are either facing uh, insolvency or they're just cutting back and they just mm. can't afford to uh, maintain offices premises uh, warehouses you know there's closures and so on and uh, layoffs and so you've got to be having a bit of an awareness of the the economic cycle because uh, commercial property can be very sensitive to those economic conditions at the moment office space is under pressure because more people are working from home uh, so in that sense it can be a bit more niche and you really do need to understand uh, what you're buying who the tenant is going to be um, what's the what's your target tenant because some of those property types as you mentioned they can potentially sit empty for a long time, not mm, up, yeah. up in residential. I know people yeah. who bought property in Ireland, you know, in 2006, and properties sat in half built housing estates empty for years on end. But generally, if you're buying in a city like Melbourne or Brisbane, you know, you don't have vacancies that go for months and months because of, you know, you, you find that the rent in residential, you find the, the level and you find a tenant. But uh, mm. in commercial, it, it can be different. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you almost have to be like a business analyst, you have to put that hat on and apply those skills when you're buying commercial property to say, okay, well, who is my target tenant if that property is is vacant? Who's going to be um, wanting this property now and how could that be impacted in the future? And we can't really reference the last five years or so because no one predicted COVID. Anyone who was buying office spaces could not have predicted what had happened um, but you need to sort of understand, well, like what are the main capital growth drivers for this area? Um, because, you know, we're not only talking about yield when it comes to commercial property. Ideally, you get some growth out of it as well. So who wants to rent it? Who's going to be wanting to buy it in the future? Your rental income will be strongly tied to the growth of that property as well. Um, and the value of that property too, because a lot of people who buy commercial properties are 
um, investors, not necessarily owner occupiers. So they place a high value on the, the lease. So the lease income and the lease terms as well. So you have to, and when you're buying a property that already has a tenant in there as well, you can't just lay back and say, great, the tenant's already in here. You still need to analyze their business and their profitability and their future, I guess, potential to pay you rent because we have seen many businesses who have a fixed term lease and they go out of business. They don't run their business properly or they've opened a a store in an area where, you know, no one wants to buy that type of product, for example. So unlike a residential lease where you're just reliant on, well, that tenant has a job. It's a bit more straightforward. It definitely is. I think, um, yeah, we already kind of uh, touched on the interpretation of commercial leases. You, you really want to get a lawyer on side because there's more complexity. There's just more chance of a dispute or, mm. you, know, um, you know, the chance of litigation is probably higher than with residential, which is more generally more clear cut. Um, you touched on there or mentioned valuation, Amy. Should we just cover off with a commercial property how valuations are arrived at? Because it's slightly different. In the residential space, usually you're just basically looking for, if you're buying a, a unit in Brunswick, you just look for another two-bedroom unit in Brunswick and you kind of, the, the it's easy to value a property really based on comparable sales. And then the market kind of decides uh, where, the, where the price point is. In commercial, finding the data to back up a valuation is much more challenging. It's not so freely available on Oh my gosh, it is. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's really more, hard. Yeah, you need to have more confidence in your ability to analyze, you know, where does where does the property sit in terms of valuation? And um, as you already uh, noted, um, the, the lease terms are going to be a big driver of that. So uh, rent capitalization, mm. um, effectively the inversion of uh, the, the yield on the property is one way that evaluation can be derived. You can also look at um, comparable sales to the extent you can find them. Yeah. Uh, but also things like um, land value per square meter and also uh, building cost or replacement cost of the actual uh, building component. Uh, so there's different ways you can arrive at evaluation. There's no fixed way of doing it. Uh, usually a combination of all of those ways would be uh, how I'd approach it. I'd look for comparable sales. I'd look for what properties are selling for per square meter, uh, particularly if you're buying like an industrial yard or something like that, uh, but also building cost and building replacement cost uh, per square meter as well. Uh, but yeah. it's not like in the residential space where there's stacks and stacks of uh, sales uh, sheets and uh, you, you've got access to uh, sales databases and things like that. You, you have to work a lot harder really to find comparables. It's really challenging and uh, quite often commercial sales results are undisclosed. So it can be a case of actually having to call that real estate agent to say, hey, what did this sell for? And I know my husband has to do this all the time um, because for some reason, even though it could benefit everyone, they like to withhold that information. And for, if you're buying a, a shop in a strip, you know, just say, go down Brunswick Street here in Fitzroy, there are going to be a lot more comparable sales for that particular shop than there would be a more unique or scarce type of property. But just to come back to that whole idea around the rent capitalization thing, you could have two shops exactly side by side. They're the same building. They're the same street. Everything about them is the same. Square meter is the same. If one of their rental amounts is far higher, that property is worth much more, obviously, depending on the length of that lease term, leftover, et cetera, because the value is um, like derived quite a lot out of the value that that lease is providing and the cash flows that that's providing to the landlord as well, which is really different to residential property where we really only use the comparable sales method. Sometimes I see people try and apply per square meter rates to, to residential property and it just doesn't really work that way. Um, but when you've got really large commercial properties, just say, for example, we're talking about one of those skyscrapers in the city, that's just a totally different ballpark when it comes to doing valuations. You know, they're working off modeling, they're working off discounted 
And I think uh, maybe people listening to this podcast aren't necessarily out there to go and buy a, a big skyscraper. Uh, but yeah, depending on the type of commercial property you're then purchasing might depend on the valuation method involved as well. So if we're looking at when we're, what we've talked about quite a lot so far today, Pete, is yields and in other words, like your rental amount coming in and the cash flows tend to be more appealing for commercial properties. But at the same time, you know, it, it'd be great to get a bit of capital growth too. Um, and commercial properties, they do tend, well, some of them will have capital growth depending on the type of property, et cetera. It's not necessarily the reason why someone is going to invest in them, especially if we're looking at something like a, a strata office, you know, within a larger office, like that, they don't typically have great growth prospects, but they will provide you a bit of cash flow. Um, but overall, there are similar growth drivers to commercial property as there are to residential property. It is very heavily influenced by the larger, broader macroeconomic um, conditions. For example, interest rates, they will have a direct, immediate, strong uh, impact on the capital growth of commercial property because it's going to straight away impact borrowing capacities and cash flows, et cetera. But then you've also got to look at other things like, you know, if there's population growth in that area, what type of people are moving into that area? In other words, who's going to be buying those commercial properties in the future and who's going to be renting them? And the overall popularity, the income growth in that area too, gentrification. If you've got more people coming into the area who have more money, they have more money to spend in these commercial spaces. If we're talking about retail, for example, therefore that will drive the the, the, the desire for um, higher value tenancies in that location and tenants coming in, uh, increase in rents, scarcity of that type of commercial property as well. Because bear in mind, it's the same as re residential. You could buy in an industrial area, and then there could be large amount of construction in that area of more similar types of industrial properties as well who are competing against yours. So all of these things, you know, it is similar to residential property. You have to say, well, what, why are people wanting this property? But both from a purchase in the future in point of view, but also from a tenant point of view, which is much, it, it, that's, that's the key difference here with residential. Yes, you still do, do need to understand your ten, tenant demographics, um, but the tenant demographics are less of a driver of residential growth than they are commercial growth. I think you're right. So, we, yes, you, we've talked a bit about the differences, but in some senses, you know, still real estate is the asset class, a lot of similarities. I think uh, you're right. So, the, the big sort of uh, discounted cash flow methods of uh, valuing a big office building, like, you, you know, most average investors, the mum and dads, as you as you rightly termed them, most people aren't doing that, but you still would, still, you still want to be running the numbers on a commercial property. I think probably even more so than with a residential property because you're basically building a business case here mm. and um you know if you're not going to get potentially not going to get as much capital growth you really need to see that the numbers work if you're putting down a bigger deposit you know how long is it going to take to pay off the mortgage what does the net yield look like um factor in vacancy so you're really presenting yourself a business case and uh it doesn't need to be overly sophisticated in terms of using discount rates and so on, but you do need to be compensated for doing it. And as you said, the growth drivers have been very similar. It's the business cycle, interest rates, population growth, uh, areas that are getting more popular. So Southeast Queensland, where we've been buying, you can see there's increases in rents because you've got scarce properties and there's not much supply coming on. And uh, the businesses are growing. There's new projects going in like Caboolture West and places like that. It's, it's just bringing demand for industrial property. And uh, that's what drives it forward, I suppose. Uh, and in the same way as in residential, there's ways to add value to commercial property. You can find a property that's under leased in terms of the rent. You know, that's a possibility to purchase, renegotiate a lease at market rent, maybe adding some value in a different way. Um, you know, you're probably not renovating like you would a, a stylish house in uh, South Yarra or something like that, but it, there's still potential uh, to add value uh, to commercial property as well. Um, I suppose we should mention here that you don't need to actually buy um, commercial properties 
directly you can invest in the uh, in this space through real estate investment trusts um or REITs as they're known or a REITs in Australia um returns on those have been very solid and these days there's an ETF for almost anything Vanguard and others cover that space um again uh, just be wary of the cyclical element to commercial property so uh, there's some big uh Big drawdown, shall we say, in the global financial crisis. And more recently, office space has been under pressure. But again, yeah, I think, um, yes, commercial property is different from residential, but lots of similarities as well, as you said. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So if we're considering purchasing a commercial property, you've still got to do your due diligence, same as residential uh, it might be, it will look a little bit different overall to residential as well. You need to, if it's, the property is already tenanted, you really need to pay attention of the particulars of that lease and ideally go and get uh, legal advice too to review the terms and conditions of that lease, the particulars, you know, what kind of security you have on that lease, for example, the bond amount or any kind of guarantor. And do a lot of due diligence on the tenant as well if that property is already leased. You know, what kind of business do they run? What's the sustainability of that business? Do they pay rent on time? Are they in arrears, et cetera? It's kind of the same as residential. And also understanding the zoning. And that's that's something I suppose we should have touched on at the start, Pete, is zone, the zoning of a property will dictate the types of use that could be done in that in that particular zoning for example residential zoning you can't just open up a farm or a factory or you can't go and live in industrial zoning for example and every state will have different um you know ways that they define these things but for example here in victoria you can go and read the planning scheme of a local council area and just read you know the what residential zoning permits what does industrial zoning permit and within that you know you'll have com- different levels of commercial zoning commercial one commercial two etc and that's really important to understand as well because the types of uses available to your future tenant will be limited by that zoning and determine if they need a permit or not to operate their business and Tenants can apply and you can approve a tenant to rent a commercial property subject to them getting a permit and therefore you need to have confidence around, well, are they actually going to get this permit? Are the people in the area already doing this, which could give you, you know, them a better chance as well because there's so much more creativity with commercial leases. You can lease, there's um, commercial investors who will actually provide financial incentives to a tenant to help them get up and running. They'll provide them six months rent free or they will actually uh, do the fit out or they'll provide them financial assistance. That is unheard of in residential, isn't it? So there's so much more, I guess, yeah, complexity but creativity in a good way because then once you get that tenant in and get them up and running, then they, that, they will add value to your property as well. So a lot, I would say a lot more due diligence overall in the commercial space, especially with valuing that property, which like you said, is really, really hard sometimes um, and around that tenancy as well. And just the, 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 um, the business itself and the economic conditions of that area, et cetera. And I think you need to be comfortable um, if there's a six-month vacancy. How does that impact your appetite for investing in commercial? If you if you can't stomach a vacancy, it may not be the right um, space for you. Um, so lots to consider there. It's an absolutely huge subject. The more you uh, delve into it, of course, like the more different rabbit holes you can go down. But I think, um, yeah, I suppose to try and sort of pull this together, Amy, I think, I mean, that's a kind of a taster or a flavour of, uh, what you can do in the commercial space. I think, um, you know, a country like Australia got a growing, rapidly growing population and an aging population. So things like medical centres will be popular, mm. childcare centres. And Always. I think especially, yes, it, the demand for industrial and warehouse and factory type property is strong. I think office space at the mo- moment is going through a uh, very difficult time. And I think retail property is a little bit niche. I think, um always come back to uh, where I used to live in Sydney and uh, the most popular shopping strip in Australia is Oxford Street through Paddington and then we got two new big shopping centres one at 
Bondi Junction, Westfield, and then one on Pitt Street. And yeah, there's loads of vacancies along uh, Oxford Street, which was unthinkable in a previous cycle. So I think retail is great if you if you understand the asset class, but it's a bit more fickle and a bit more niche. Um, so yeah, there's more to think about, I think, in terms of commercial, but potentially more opportunities as well. Yeah, worth exploring. And I remember when my husband first said, we should, we should buy a factory or we should buy an industrial property. I said, oh, just it just doesn't interest me as much to be honest it's not as romantic it's not as exciting as buying a you know a, a house or a townhouse or something that i could renovate and add value to and you know for me i not wasn't as excited about it but if you just sit down and have a look at the the numbers and just making sure that that fits into your longer term strategy as well to say okay well, what do i need to achieve out of this property what do i want to achieve if it is it more like of a cash flow um, option for me. Um, and in which case, like if I spent that money elsewhere on residential, got a lower yield and higher growth, is that more beneficial? It might be worth speaking to a financial planner to get advice around this, especially if you're looking at building a portfolio over time as well to say, well, is this the right option for me? And then speaking to your mortgage broker as well, because again, like you said, Pete, you might require a much higher deposit than you expect to get into this space. So I hope that's been helpful as a kind of a 101 to commercial property. Perhaps it's uh, created more questions than answers for you, which is great. Ask, ask us some more questions. You can send them in to us and we'd be happy to tackle them in a future episode. Yeah, if it stimulates your interest, there's plenty of information out there these days. So yes, if interior designs your thing, then uh, you're <laughs> probably best sticking to residential. But um, if you're thinking of diversifying uh, to a higher yielding or an asset class with higher net returns, then commercial may well be the way to go uh, to add to your portfolio. So, um, Amy, I think we can uh, wrap it up there. We didn't quite get to keep it to 40 minutes, but uh, we did pretty well overall, considering there's so many different uh, parts and aspects to commercial as an asset class. So always enjoy the uh, catch ups, Amy, and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks for your time, Pete. See you later. Thanks for tuning in to the Australian Property Podcast. If you love the show, why not subscribe or leave us a review on Apple or Spotify? And if you want to work with me, Amy, Pete or Chris, you'll find links in your podcast player to get in contact with us. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Australian Property Podcast. We're huge advocates of getting the right advice at the right time from the right people. That's why it's important to understand that this podcast episode contained general financial information only. It is not designed to be specific or personalized to your financial, tax or legal situation. With property, the check sizes are pretty big, so it's important you get advice from a licensed and trusted professional before acting on the information you hear in RAS podcasts. Thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Before you go, I wanted to share some things with you. Specifically, I wanted to tell you about the 10 ways that Rask could help you in 2024. As many of you know, Rask has grown to become one of the biggest investing and finance platforms in Australia. Across our podcasts, our websites, our memberships, and so on, we now engage around 200,000 Aussies. Which, considering we started in a humble lounge room on a Kmart desk, one of those old fake white wooden ones, I'm pretty ecstatic about where we are six years later. As part of becoming one of Australia's biggest platforms for wealth creation and preservation, we now have a very special position in the country in that we can bring you some of the best, most thoughtful, expert-driven ways to protect and grow your wealth. And I'm going to share some of those with you now. I've got 10 ways that we can potentially help you or match you with someone who can. The first thing that I want to tell you about is the biggest step we've ever taken at Rask, which is the launch of our Rask Invest platform. This is a platform that lets our team, led by me, invest for you, primarily through low-cost, diversified ETFs. We'll have three strategies at launch, And every investor who comes through can pick one of the three strategies being a balanced strategy, a growth strategy, and a high growth strategy. 
The balanced strategy focuses on passive income and the high growth strategy focuses on longer term compounding. You will find a link in your podcast player to register your interest. We will be taking off soon. Number two, if you prefer to DIY your investing, you can join me and over 4,000 members inside Rascore. That's our full ETF and ASX share research membership community. You can join now and you'll get updated ETF portfolio recommendations every quarter, as well as ongoing ASX and global stock research. Every single month, we call them the all-star stocks. You get that alongside the ETF portfolios as well as other members-only content. It's called Rascore. Number three, our first ever partnership with a business other than our own was a business by the name of Blusk, which has since become Flint Group. Flint Group is led by Chris Bates and Christian Stevens, two of Australia's most highly regarded mortgage brokers. Already over 200 Rask community members have begun the Rask plus Flint Group mortgage broking process. You can click the link in your podcast player if you're refinancing, investing, a first home buyer, or whatever. You've probably heard Chris on the show many times. Number four, you can connect with our most trusted financial advisors. Whether you're 25 years old, just graduated uni and looking to set yourself up, or approaching or in retirement and you've got that nest egg you want to protect and generate a passive income from, you can get in contact with our trusted panel of financial advisors. You can find the link in your podcast player. It's there each and every week. Just click the thing that says financial planning. Number five, if you want specialist insurance advice, as Warren Buffett said, rule number one is don't lose money. And rule number two is don't forget rule number one. Insurance is vitally important, especially when it comes to your number one asset, you. Whether you're a single income household or a couple and you just want to protect what would happen if you want to protect your family, if something goes wrong, you want to protect your spouse, if you lose your job, you want to protect yourself, if you hurt yourself on the weekend at footy, insurance is a way to do that. And I think the best way to do insurance is through a financial planner. And there's a few reasons for that, but one of them is sometimes Some insurers will only work with financial advisors, but they can also be your companion as you go through the sometimes daunting process of getting insurance done properly. Sometimes you might not even know, but you're not even covered, even though you think you are. So get the right advice. You'll find a link in the show notes to check that out. Number six, buying property. If you're like me and you're thinking of buying property in the next 12 months, or maybe you've already invested and you're looking to downsize, getting the right advice and being able to build wealth through property is a proven strategy. It might be one of the most contentious, but I think that we have one of Australia's best property coaches in our ranks. That is Pete Wargent. Pete is the host of the now super popular Australian property podcast by Rask, and he's also my analyst team's macro consultant. So if you're a member of Rascor, you will have seen Pete's name around the traps. He's a property coach and buyer's agent, and he works with a select number of people each and every year. Just a note on this. This is not a commercial thing with Pete. Pete just has great services, so we offer them to the community. And when he fills up, he fills up. You can find out more about Pete's coaching in the show notes. Next up, tracking your portfolio for tax. I think you are because I think you have to. So we've partnered with Nevexa to help you manage your share and ETF reporting, whether it's tax or performance. All Rask users get 20% off an annual plan with Nevexa. You can sync your portfolio with Nevexa software and it automatically tracks your dividends, your capital gains tax, and more. Again, not a commercial partnership. We don't make anything from working with Nevexa, but they do create some great tools which the Rask community uses each and every day. Number eight, want to run your own business? Maybe you already do. If you want more profit, but less stress, less time consumed, and less energy lost, get in contact. We have a partner business called Inflection. The Inflection Accelerator Program is a complete online course that helps you and a community of members engage and follow a proven strategy for growing your business. I'm grateful to be one of the coaches inside the Accelerator program, helping business owners right across Australia. You can find more following the link in your podcast player. It's the one that says coaching. 
Number nine, if you haven't already checked it out, join over 20,000 other people who tune into the Rask YouTube channel. It is completely free and you get notified when we go live and when we publish podcast episodes. There is a podcast on the Rask network each and every day, as well as bite-sized material that's less than 60 seconds or those really punchy tutorials and webinars that are just 15 minutes that take you through a really exciting topic, whether it's how to buy a property, whether it's how to pick a dividend ETF. Some of our most popular content actually just explains things like, what the heck is franking credits and how do I calculate if I've got some? That's on our YouTube channel. Number 10, if you want to be a better investor, a saver, a better partner with money, or just understand your own relationship with money, you can do that all of that by going to the Rask Education website and taking a free course. We've enrolled over 26,000 students at the time of this recording, and we are on a mission to get to 100,000 in the next few years. Rask Education is our mostly free education platform covering everything from budgeting and automation to the probably, I would say, the best value investing program in the country. So whether you're a value investor an intermediate investor, you want to know how to value Woolworth shares, or you simply just want to understand what ethical investing is or buy your first property and what actually happens on settlement day, head to the Rask Education website and enroll in something today. It is free and it supports us because then I can come on here next month and I can say we've got 27,000 and hopefully we reach critical mass where we can help more Australians manage their money better. Thank you for listening to this long-winded ad If you want to get in contact with me, you know where to go. There's a link in your show notes. Basically, these 10 services, even though some of them we don't make any money from, support RASC and allow us to produce these podcasts, attract the biggest and best guests from Australia and around the world, and bring them to you to answer your questions. Thank you for being part of the RASC network, and thank you for your ongoing support. Bye for now.